can get started. So, welcome to Grand Rounds for April. I can't believe it's the end of April already. Today we have uh, Carissa Snelling. Uh, she is the director of our out of outpatient pediatric occupational therapy at St. Luke's. She earned her bachelor's degree in psychology and master's of science degree in occupational therapy with a pediatric specialization from the Missouri University. She holds a board certification in pediatrics from the American Occupational Therapy Association. Ms. Snelling has worked in early intervention, outpatient, and inpatient pediatric settings, and she is well versed in the area of neonatal abstinence syndrome, having worked in an inpatient pediatric rehabilitation setting with a dedicated NAS program, and presented on the topic locally, regionally, and at the state level. And just some, uh, before I turn it over, some housekeeping. Make sure you pick up a quiz, a feedback form, and a self-reflection form. I need all three of what all three completed and handed to me uh, at the end in order to get your certificate. Uh, if you're watching this online, uh, make sure you email me for for those three documents so that you can complete them to get credit. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Ms. Snelling. Thank you, Steve, uh, and I appreciate everyone taking time, especially over the lunch hour, to visit and to um, gain some education and additional knowledge for our families. Um, so, of course, a disclaimer, um, really no financial relationships to disclose, so a pretty boring slide, but important nonetheless. Um, so just to um, highlight what our outcomes are for today, my goal is that you'll leave our one hour time together with the ability to summarize the etiology and some defining characteristics um, utilized in the differential diagnosis of neonatal abstinence syndrome. I'd also like for you to be able to explain at least three elements of the process of therapeutic meeting in the NICU setting based upon the differential diagnosis of NAS and ultimately describe three benefits of non-pharmacological intervention strategies based on that differential diagnosis. So before we kind of dive in to the topic and learn a little bit more about what exactly is this diagnosis, I always kind of like to set the stage of why. Why is this something I'm presenting about? Why is it something I'm curious about? Why is it something we need to understand better? Um, so this data comes from 2016. So arguably, it's already dated. Um, but this quote tells us that every hour a baby is born with NAS, totaling uh, greater than 10,000 annually. And that's a national statistic. If we turn our focus just to our state of Pennsylvania, again, this information is 2018 numbers, so dated because it's looking back historically. The rate of NAS in newborns has increased greater than 1,000% from fiscal year 01 to, oh, I'm sorry, fiscal year 2000 to 01, all the way up to fiscal year 2016, 2017. This is a map that's put out by the Pennsylvania Healthcare Cost Containment Council. It highlights each county in Pennsylvania and describes rates of NAS births per 1,000. This data, again, a little bit dated from fiscal year 2017. What's most notable to me is sort of those outlying rural counties having the spikes in the rates of NAS. And what we know about the overall national opioid epidemic is that a lot of those sort of poverty-stricken and rural communities tend to be harder hit with the opioid crisis. It would just make sense that those rural communities would also then have that next generation of babies being born um, exposed in utero. Interestingly enough, Medicaid was the anticipated payer in almost 87% of NAS-related hospital admissions in 2017, making this more of a public health um, discussion than ever because we have to consider the financial outcomes of uh, these diagnoses. So as we know, this crisis is often talked about in news media, social media, print media, et cetera. There's not a day that goes by that we don't hear a little bit more about the opioid crisis in the US. What we can say is that NAS, as a part of the larger opioid crisis, is gaining political attention, policy changes, and then what's most beneficial is distribution of resources. 
Um, this is a picture taken of Governor Wolf back in July um, when he signed Act 54, which we'll talk a little bit about how that's benefiting um, babies born with NAS in terms of resource distribution. So now we can dive a little bit further to understand, well, what exactly is NAS? We know why we're discussing it. Let's learn a little bit more about what it is. So throughout pregnancy, there is a drug transfer from the mother to the fetus via the placenta. The placenta transfer is abruptly interrupted at delivery, resulting in that withdrawal effect. The presentation of NAS is extremely variable. Um, the literature talks about a constellation of signs and symptoms, meaning that they affect multiple systems but can be categorized by groupings. The presentation can change based on the type of drug or drugs exposed to um, the infant in utero, the frequency and dosage of use, the gestational age of the neonate, and placental opioid metabolism. So typically this becomes a cumulative effect, right? So what the literature tells us is that preterm infants who've had less exposure over time can sometimes have lessening um, symptoms of NAS, whereas the 39, 40, even 41 weaker can have greater cumulative exposure to drugs, therefore having greater withdrawal. And again, just to highlight, it's a grouping of similar behavioral and physiological signs and symptoms. Basically, we can look at three different systems. We can look at the central nervous system and some of the dysfunctions associated with the presentation of NAS. Um, you may, if you're a parent, an aunt, an uncle, or caregiver to any infant, you may look at these and kind of shake your head and say, well, how different is this than the typical newborn, right? So excessive crying, irritability, sleep-wake disturbances, this kind of categorizes typical newborn development, right? So we're talking about extremes, right? So we're talking about a high-pitched cry that is unmistakable. If you ask any NICU nurses, are there any in the room? One, if you ask any NICU nurse to differentiate between a typical newborn cry and an NAS um, newborn cry, they will know it instantaneously. It is so distinct. You're nodding your head, so I know that we're <laughs> making a good connection here. Excessive irritability. Again, this isn't the kind of irritability that um, the typical shushing, swaddling, rocking, bouncing, shushing in the ear will calm. This is completely excessive. Inconsolability is another word we would use. Sleep-wake disturbances, again, not atypical for a newborn, but these are babies who can't sleep more than two, three, five minutes max before they're, again, needing that comforting and calming. So really severe or exaggerated um, newborn behavior. Alternations in tone and movement, so there could be presentations of spasticity, tremors, jitteriness, things like that. Hyperactive reflexes, hypertonicity, like I mentioned, tremors, seizures, another um, hallmark in this population. Uh, skin excoriation is something that um, people are kind of surprised about, but because of some of the jitters and the extraneous movement, a lot of babies will have skin breakdown along the bony prominences against the um, crib sheet. Um, so that's where we see a lot of our excoriation. And then exaggerated reflexes, most commonly the mora, which is sort of that I'm falling in outer space and no one is catching me. Um, reflex. We also see uh, dysfunction in the autonomic nervous system, so we'll see excessive sweating, fever, nasal congestion, tachypnea, skin modeling, excessive yawning, dilated pupils, nasal flaring. Um, again, to the untrained eye, these might not be overly concerning, but when we look at them against the backdrop of this larger pervasive um, multi-systemic issue, we realize how um, difficult this can be for the baby. The third area that we look at is gastrointestinal system dysfunction. Um, so these babies are really poor oral feeders, contrary to how they present. So they are hyperphagic. And if you can imagine um, Maggie Simpson from The Simpsons sort of suck, 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 sucking on her pacifier. So these babies are great suckers, but they have terrible coordination once liquid is presented in their mouth. And I love that my NICU nurse is nodding every time I mention something about these babies. Um, so when they have a pacifier in their mouth, they're going to town. They're chomping away. It's not calming them, it's not soothing them, but that's just that hyper-over-exaggerated um, reflex. 
when we present liquid, they have extreme difficulty coordinating a safe, effective, and efficient swallow, thereby making difficulty for weight gain, um, but just overall intolerance to feeding experiences, typically also presenting with diarrhea, dehydration, and electrolyte imbalance. So you can kind of see that whole loop of how things can be really difficult. So this slide um, is really meant to highlight the fact that we are not typically seeing babies exposed to one substance in utero. We are seeing babies exposed to poly substances, so multiple substances, right? Um, so if you look at the comparison of the different substances on this slide, you can imagine how kind of taken together this can present um, for a baby to have a really, really difficult start. The important thing to also recognize is that NAS doesn't always have to be related to drug abuse. We see here on the bottom of the grid SSRIs. So these may be administered by a physician um, for an expectant mother who's going through um, some type of behavioral health concern. And so in conjunction, maybe with some other substances, whether legal or illegal, we can also talk about pain. Um, collectively, these substances are really resulting in that constellation of, of symptoms. Typically, symptoms can appear during the first 48 to 72 hours of life. Some symptoms begin as late as four weeks of life. Um, I was just chatting with a um, visiting nurse, and we were talking about our experiences in the home setting through early intervention. And in my history, I've met with many, many, many foster parents who had no knowledge that the child that they were fostering was exposed in utero, they're in their custody for four weeks time and these symptoms are manifesting, leading to rehospitalization for things like withdrawal symptoms, dehydration, poor weight gain. Um, so that window of time where the presentation is actually rearing its head is so variable and sometimes that anticipatory guidance can't be delivered as uh, appropriate. Symptom uh, duration can last from several weeks to several months, again, due to all of those factors affecting how that baby is um, receiving and also metabolizing the substances. And then certainly we know there are long-term consequences that restrict optimal neurodevelopment. So in order to know the what, how to intervene, we have to know why. So why are we intervening for the, with these babies? So during their NICU course, um, there's typically a pharmacological and non-pharmacological intervention. Interventions will vary depending on scores that an infant will receive using a Finnegan NAS scoring tool. Um, so essentially, this is a tool that was developed actually in 1975 that has undergone very little modification, and it is typically administered by um, NICU nurses. And so the nurses are looking at all of those signs and symptoms we just described and scoring the severity for the infant. And those scores will then be uh, communicated to the medical team and a decision will be made about the rate um, and dosage of their weaning protocol. Methadone has been found in the literature to be the most effective tool for therapeutic weaning. Interestingly, as this um, diagnosis is gaining more um, interest and more research, we're doing things differently. Um, a number of years ago, when I was working in early intervention, as I described, babies were being sent home on the methadone weaning protocol. We would never do that today. So, you know, you're sending a baby home with an unstable social environment, and we're expecting the caregivers to administer their, wean, their weaning dose um, and really give that pharmacological intervention. Um, about three years ago, I met with a uh, insurance company um, that was very large, and in the meeting, there were three medical directors. One of the medical directors was absolutely appalled that anyone would send a baby home on a weaning protocol, and the other two medical directors were appalled that a baby would be staying in the NICU just for the purpose of weaning. 
So that was about three years ago. So the consensus is really um, you know, kind of coming to a peak. And again, when we know more, we do more. So things are sort of rapidly evolving with this diagnosis. And as um, the science evolves and we learn more about best practice, we're doing things a little bit differently. What we can say from the literature is that non-pharmacological therapy should be the standard of care, regardless of the additional need for medication therapy. So when we look at non-pharmacological treatment, we're looking at really three ways to support the developing newborn. We're looking at how to support facilitating state regulation, so sort of that calming, um, improving participation in daily care routines, feeding, diapering, bathing, gentle holding, bonding with the caregiver, and then promoting improved feeding and digestion for growth. Under the category of facilitating state regulation, there are many non-pharmacological strategies. Developmental handling and positioning, low volume white noise, natural light, swaddling and cuddling, pacifier presentation, low intensity vestibular sensory input, position variation, and cue-based feeding. So these may sound very, very simple. Um, and things that we would do with our typically developing newborns. The difference here is the frequency, intensity, and dosage of that intervention, right? So it has to really match what symptom that they're displaying, and we not need to monitor the outcome, right? So it's not that we can just put these babies in a mama roo or a bouncy swing, seat or swing and just kind of expect them to calm. We have to really carefully critique and understand what those little signs and symptoms are and how we're able to um, remedy them. We need to look at maternal rooming in. So there's great literature out there about how a mother rooming in and breastfeeding with the newborn actually decreases the length of stay of the NICU and reduces the length of time that they're weaning from methadone. So you might be scratching your head thinking, why would these babies be breastfed? So hold on to that curiosity, we'll get there, but it's a good thought. Um, we also wanna look at clustered care, so making sure that care is kind of coordinated so that weight checks and blood pressure and temperature and diapering are kind of done in a short sequence so that the baby can have a prolonged period of preserved rest. We wanna promote a flexed position during care. A lot of these babies can sort of be hyperextended and not know where the center of their body is. So for calming and comforting, um, really that flexed position is so ideal. We also wanna layer and phase supports as appropriate. So it isn't as though these babies need this intensity of support all the time. We need to kind of look again at how they're presenting and kind of push and pull as necessary. And then ultimately, cue-based feeding. So when that baby is showing us readiness, that's when they should be fed rather than following the clock. In terms of feeding and digestion, again, that cue-based feeding. We want that baby to learn satiety. We want them to be able to learn to calm and regulate themselves. And they're not able to do that if we're kind of just offering a bottle every two hours arbitrarily. We really want them to show that readiness for feeding. As I mentioned, breastfeeding. So the literature tells us that when appropriate, if a mother has completed her recovery, um, even if she's on um, some different recovery meds, there are actually great benefits um, for breastfeeding in reducing the wean and reducing the length of stay. We know from our literature in preterm infants that kangaroo care or that skin-to-skin -skin contact has great outcomes with regard to increasing body weight, maintaining temperature, um, and just overall the maternal satisfaction and the endorphins released from that. The same would be true for that NAS patient. At times, we need to look at the bottle or nipple system that's being used. There might need to be a slower rate or a change of position to feed the infant to improve their success, safety, and efficiency. Um, tummy time, tummy time, tummy time. We can't say it enough for a million reasons, but these babies really thrive positioned on their stomachs. And then infant massage as appropriate. So what we know is that increased non-pharmacological treatments can ultimately reduce the use of pharmacological care. Reduced use of pharmacological intervention results in decreased lengths of stay, 
And improving parental and caregiver knowledge of cue reading can actually improve opportunities for co-regulation and bonding. And what the literature tells us is that infant responsiveness, how the caregiver attends to and anticipates the infant's needs, are key indicators for future neurodevelopmental outcomes. Family-centered care is crucial and really the hallmark of all of pediatric therapy. Um, what we know from the literature is that a caring, non-judgmental approach may encourage maternal participation, and active maternal participation is really the best non-pharmacological care. So let's look at sort of the continuum of pediatric therapy as it applies to this diagnosis. Um, so when we look at the baby, um, we know that they're going to be spending the first chunk of their life in the neonatal intensive care unit, followed by a discharge to home and community. Um, in home and community settings, they can access early intervention and outpatient therapy. So really the arrow is meant to kind of show um, the developmental continuum and how pediatric therapy can be all encompassing. So I pulled um, the Physical Therapy, um, American Physical Therapy Association, um, just to find out what their sort of um, position statement is on the role of uh, physical therapists in the NICU. Physical therapists can provide evidence-based developmental interventions that improve outcomes for infants born preterm. So um, physical therapists are experts in the area of movement, in the area of muscle tone, and just sort of dynamic functioning, right? So when we're looking at these infants and we're looking at their movement and their motor patterns and all of the things that are going to be um, prequels to future rolling and crawling and walking, we really want the knowledge and skills of our physical therapists to be addressing um, these babies. Occupational therapists, a little more verbose. Uh, occupational therapy's multifaceted and holistic approach to the NICU environment includes comprehensive management of the infant and family and supportive staff. Neuroprotective and developmentally appropriate interventions are critical, considering their influence on short and long-term outcomes for the child and family. Um, so OTs really pride themselves on kind of analyzing the situation, right? So, you know, what is this mother baby dyad looking like? You know, what is the environment looking like? How can we be supportive of the care providers in this baby's role? Um, there can be considerable burnout. These babies are exhausting to take care of, and it really does take a village. Um, so as an OT, I kind of want to look at sort of this bigger um, picture of that child's community. Our speech therapist friends, most verbose of all, I had to use dot, dot, dot in here, recognizing the significant impact of development of communication, cognition, feeding and swallowing in the developing infant, speech language pathologists possess the knowledge and skills to be proficient in the delivery of team-based services to preterm and medically compromised infants and their families. Um, really sums it up beautifully, right? So um, we, we know our speech language pathologists are going to be intervening with regards to oral feeding, swallowing function, um, but there's also that pre-linguistic, let's prepare this baby to be a future successful kindergartner, a future successful reader, um, someone who has those successes in life um, from a communication standpoint. So let's just look at, look at a case to really kind of pull things together. Um, this is the case of Brayden, born at 39 weeks gestation with polysubstance exposure in utero. Brayden presented with the classic excessive high-pitched cry, was unable to safely coordinate suck-swallow breathing synchrony, 100% NG tube uh, dependent, had poor tolerance to handling, positioning, diapering, and bathing from caregivers, unable to sleep more than five minutes at a time, a very hyperactive moral reflex, and had difficulty uh, weaning from methadone. The discharge disposition included kinship care. 
Um, so I'm just going to pause for a minute to talk about kinship care. So for many of our babies um, who are born and diagnosed with NAS, um, there often is a unstable social, social situation, and the discharge disposition can often be to family members, including grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, um, or if necessary, outside of the kinship realm and into the foster care system. Um, so in this case, the paternal grandparents who happen to be retired, um, living in a single family home with access to transportation had volunteered to provide that kinship care. So referrals were made within the NICU to PT, OT, and speech. Following the PT of Val, the physical therapist provided education to the nursing team and caregivers to promote and maintain that physiologic flexion position prior to and during care routines. The physical therapist also gave anticipatory guidance on position variability to reduce the risk for torticollis and um, subsequent plagiocephaly. In terms of OT, following evaluation, uh, the occupational therapist assisted the nursing team and caregivers with strategies to reduce environmental overstimulation, recommending increased cuddling time with volunteers and encouraging the use of a swaddle bath, so kind of encompassing that baby um, in a bath towel or a swaddle blanket while bathing. Third, following an evaluation, the speech-language pathologist recommended feeding trials using a slow-flow nipple, positioning the infant in a sideline position, and providing external pacing once the infant assisted in achieving a calm, alert, awake state. So just to highlight um, the spectrum of non-pharmacological interventions, we're looking at really um, several key factors here. We're looking at environmental modification, we're looking at family-centered care, we're really looking at promoting that bonding and attachment, positive sensory exploration and experiences, and developmental facilitation. So we want to best prepare this infant to go out into the real world um, to be as prepared as possible, both internally and externally. What does the literature tell us about long term, right? So a lot of focus is on like what's happening with these babies acutely? What's happening in the hospitals? Let's sort of fast forward a little bit. What's happening with them in kindergarten, in high school, in college? Um, so the literature does say that these children do go on to have significant visual problems, not just with acuity, but with visual functioning, practicality, depth perception, um, convergence, divergence, all of the skills that we use every day naturally um, to make sure that we're successful with academics, the workplace, driving. Um, these vision problems are persistent across all areas of development. Frequent, frequent, frequent ear infections. Um, this is definitely the hallmark um, of this diagnosis long term. These babies have chronic, chronic ear infections. We see motor delays. We see cognitive and executive function challenges. We see significant hyperactivity, poor academic performance, risk for adverse childhood experiences, future trauma, drug exposure, having a parent incarcerated, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have some new studies, they're animal studies, um, about epigenetics. So in terms of future generations, are we kind of making changes? We know that uh, different chemical receptors in rat studies are actually influenced. Um, when there is um, neonatal exposure. And so we don't have any human studies, understandably, um, but it's definitely something that we need to consider and something where um, I think science is taking us. So let's fast forward. So this baby is now home in the community. Um, let's talk about early intervention. So early intervention is a service delivery model provided at no cost to families in Pennsylvania for children between the ages of birth and three. It's covered under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, Part C, and it's administered by county in Pennsylvania. Um, newborns diagnosed with NAS are referred to early intervention prior to discharge from the NICU, and counties have 45 days to complete an initial evaluation, meet with the family, and come up with an individual family service plan. Services are meant to provide parents and caregivers with training and coaching to support the child's overall development. Uh, 
um, this is not to be confused with a medical model where there's more hands-on, more use of technology, um, and typically not in the home setting. Parents and caregivers are encouraged to set goals for their child so that the focus of services can address those goals. Um, goals are typically related to routines, right? So diaper changes, getting dressed, getting um, in and out of a car seat. So what is it that's disrupting that parent's everyday routine? And that's where sort of that coaching uh, training model comes in. So when we look at physical therapy in uh, the early intervention service delivery model, uh, a physical therapist will assess and support gross motor development using elements within the child's environment, right? So that's key. We want to use what they already have. We don't want to recommend that the family goes out and gets this huge physio ball when it's not part of their normal daily routine or something that they have in their environment. Physical therapists will provide anticipatory guidance to parents and caregivers regarding ongoing development, right? So, you know, they're looking at the child where they're at, but they're really using that dynamic systems theory. Like, where do we go next? Where do we go from here? What comes next? Um, so looking at that whole developmental sequence and how can they kind of prepare the family to getting there. Practicing gross motor skills across a variety of settings with various daily routines to ensure safety and mastery, right? So the physical therapist can go with the family to the park or go with the family to the grocery store, or see how their postural stability is in the shopping cart at Wegmans. Um, that's the beauty of early intervention because it's all about the child's natural environment and routine. In terms of occupational therapy, um, an OT would assess and support fine motor, self-help, and sensory motor development using elements within the child's natural environment again. Also, recommendations for modifications to the environment and adjusting daily routines, reinforcing generalization of learned skills in multiple contexts. So one of the, um, I think, most difficult contexts for these babies is daycare, right? So the baby comes home, stayed in the NICU, mom and dad have to go back to work, somebody's got to pay the mortgage, these babies land in daycare. A daycare provider can get extremely stressed out if they don't have some guidance, some support, some coaching on how to make this child's routine a little bit more livable. Um, that was one of my favorite parts of working in early intervention was actually working with the child care provider um, because I found that they were able to make change every day. Teach therapist friends, assess and support cognitive language and feeding skill development using elements within the child's environment, recommend alternative strategies to promote independent function, and ensure all care providers are using consistent methods for communication and feeding. Um, so with regards to communication, they may institute early sign language and if necessary, um, an AAC device. So let's look at another case. Um, we'll call this child Gunther preferred by his pediatrician for delayed walking, talking, and lacking independent play skills at almost his second birthday. There was a history of polysubstance exposure in utero, a prolonged NICU stay of 17 days, and subsequent rehospitalizations due to dehydration. Gunther resided with his mother and maternal grandmother in a single family home. The family did not have access to transportation, and maternal grandmother was working while um, Gunther's mom was home during the day providing care for him. The family had initial concerns that Gunther didn't know how to play with toys and was quote unquote too lazy to walk. So in the pediatric therapy world, too lazy is a red flag for holy smokes, there's something that went awry, <clears throat> excuse me, in development. Kids are not inherently lazy. So following the multidisciplinary eval, Gunther qualified for PT and OT services. What the therapist learned after developing a rapport with the child's mother and grandmother was that as an infant, Gunther spent most of his waking hours in an infant swing and slept in a rock and play, which um, has an elevated surface at night. His mother reported the only time he wasn't crying was when he was moving. There was another report by the family that he's not happy unless he's watching videos on the TV or on our cell phone. So he was kind of pretty plugged in and had a lot more screen time um, than the Academy of Pediatrics recommends. His medical history also included recurring ear infections and frequent visits to the pediatrician and urgent care. 
So when we look at um, Gunther, um, we look at a few different elements here, right? So we know he has a history of NAS with that prolonged um, stay. We also know that he has incredibly poor self-regulation, right? So he relied on that swing or that rock and play to keep him comfortable, keep him calm, keep him comfortable. So he needed all of those external supports in order to maintain that calm state thereby reducing parent-child interaction, right? So if the baby is giving that mother the feedback of, you're not calming me, but the swing is, that mom is gonna hold that baby less and less and less. So what happens? There's less skin-to-skin -skin contact, there's less eye contact, there's less exposure to verbal communication, the list goes on and on and on. So he's really relying on that device rather than the physical um, affection and touch of his mother. Then, when we looked at how many hours a day he was in a something, whether it was a bouncy seat, a car seat, a pack and play, he was always in something, right? And so there's this um, new kind of um, environmentally imposed um, pseudo diagnosis of container baby syndrome, right? So our babies are spending so much more waking and sleeping hours in positions other than supine and prone that their development is now being restricted. Their gross motor, their fine motor, their visual motor, their feeding skills are being restricted. Um, so there's very little variability in his positioning other than that semi reclined supine position. Now, fast forward, we have some de delayed developmental milestones and significant screen time, right? So I'm soothed by swinging, movement, and blue screen. That's not gonna be sustainable for future, right? Um, so these are all the things that we kind of have to dissect to understand um, how this is really gonna affect the trajectory of development. So understanding a child's history is really crucial in making that differential diagnosis, right? So um, even though he was referred for delayed milestones, we have to really dig and dig and dig and find out why. Why are these milestones delayed? And then really key is developing that trusting relationship with the family. Um, the evaluation team meeting the family for the first time was not going to gain access to all of that key information. They weren't going to learn about how much time he spent in a swing. They weren't going to learn about how much time he used the cell phone, right? So there's this sort of imposed judgment that the family doesn't want to be as transparent. But once these people are visiting their home week after week after week, they learn to trust them. And so more information is shared. And when that information is shared, we can build a better case history. So now let's fast forward. Let's talk about outpatient therapy. Outpatient therapy is a service delivery model aimed at supporting the habilitative and rehabilitative needs of children between the ages of birth and 18. Outpatient therapy is routinely paid for by medical insurances, including medical assistance, and requires a prescription um, from a physician. I do have some asterisks. There are exceptions to these rules, such as in the case of direct access physical therapy, and when a child presents with a pediatric condition, but they're followed in a life care model. Infants and toddlers between the ages of birth and three can receive outpatient therapy and early intervention concurrently. So this is a myth that we often um, really debunk with families. They think they can either get early intervention at home and in the community, or they can go to a clinic model for outpatient therapy. Um, that's absolutely false. They can get both. And what the literature tells us is more earlier is better. Um, so we really want to reinforce that with families. So in terms of physical therapy in the outpatient environment, um, that therapist is going to screen, evaluate, and treat gross motor difficulties. Um, they are going to recommend and order bracing and equipment as necessary to promote independent mobility for successful participation in homeschool in the community. They're going to develop a home exercise program as appropriate for families to practice with their child outside of therapy. And they're going to coordinate ongoing care with a multidisciplinary team and community caregivers. In terms of the occupational therapist's role, he or she will screen, evaluate, and treat fine motor, visual motor, sensory processing, and ADL difficulties. They're going to provide direct patient care on land and in water within the context of a facility or clinic. They're going to recommend activity adaptations, environmental modifications, and adjustments to daily routine 
in order to promote more successful and independent participation. They're also going to coordinate ongoing care with a multidisciplinary team. And lastly, the speech language pathologists are going to do um, similar, screen, evaluate, and treat cognitive language and feeding difficulties. They will also evaluate for, identify, and obtain alternative augmentative communication devices, as we talked about earlier, right? So we want to make sure that child is most successful. And if things like sign language or a picture exchange communication system aren't effective, they're going to want to go for technology. They may also complete a modified barium swallow study to recommend a least restrictive diet and coordinate ongoing care. Some of the benefits of outpatient therapy um, are the use of a medical model with access to leading edge equipment and technology, so things that are not routinely found in the child's natural environment, a home, daycare, the park, the library, care from expertly trained and board certified clinicians, access to both land and water contexts, Opportunities for interdisciplinary collaboration, right? So there's a lot of hands and eyes on this child um, and opportunities for case conferencing. <coughs> the therapy dosage variability is in accordance more with clinical opinion, whereas in early intervention, um, there's kind of a <coughs> pot of money and it has to be evenly distributed. And so dosage and frequency aren't really the clinician's decision, it's more guided by the county administrators to make sure there's access to resources for all county residents. Children can receive outpatient therapy and early intervention simultaneously, and so the opportunity there is for case conferencing between the early intervention team and the outpatient team to make sure everyone's really on the same track and meeting that child and family's goals. So we'll look at the case of Shana, a five-year-old girl with a history of neonatal abstinence syndrome. She was referred by her neurologist for outpatient therapy for fine motor delays, in coordination and delayed speech. She had a history of seizures during infancy. She had a history of delayed developmental milestones. She had previously received early intervention in a different state, but recently moved to Pennsylvania. She was not currently enrolled in any formal preschool or pre-academic program. She resided with her mother, stepfather, brother, and half-sister. Her mother worked part-time, her father worked full-time, and there was a maternal uncle available to assist the family, and the family did have access to transportation. So in looking at occupational therapy, some of the findings on Shana's initial evaluation were visual and fine motor skills equivalent to age 36 months. So Shana is getting ready for kindergarten, right? And she has the fine motor and visual motor skills of a three-year-old. Um, her sensory processing revealed that she was much less aware of visual stimuli than her peers. She had increased protective reactions noted and decreased attention and poor task persistence. In terms of speech therapy, um, her auditory comprehension was equivalent to a 38-month-old level. Her expressive communication um, was closer to 34 months. She did have an intelligibility rating of 90%, and her mom reported that she can follow um, one-step directions. So um, in Shana's case, um, we want to really highlight the fact that she was really one of those kids that fell off the radar, um, right? So she had services in another state, she came to Pennsylvania, and services kind of went by the wayside, right? So the family had the early intervention in place, but they didn't really have access to the outpatient services. So now they're in a new state, there's a new system, um, and they're just kind of getting comfortable with it. Um, it's also important to recognize that for the occupational therapist and the speech therapist, their biggest goals are really going to be getting her ready for kindergarten. Um, so she's entering in the fall, um, and she, she really needs to have all those pre-academic skills to make her as successful as possible. Um, more than anything, we want her to be motivated to learn. And so what she was showing us um, with her skill deficits was that there was an opportunity for us to um, see decreased motivation for learning. Um, Shane is an ongoing case, so I don't have a conclusion um, for you, other than the fact that um, just this week we were referred her for physical therapy due to her in coordination issues. 
So when we talk about um, physical therapy at St. Luke's, we'll, we'll, we went from the nation to the state, and now we'll, we'll be a little more local. Um, so St. Luke's is actually a provider of early intervention services in Lehigh County. Our Cindy Miles Pediatrics facility um, located in Whitehall actually has a contract with Lehigh County. And what most parents do not know is that they can elect their early intervention provider. Um, this is something that's not widely known from parents, but they do have that choice and that right. Most families will think, oh, it's a free service. I kind of just, you know, get the round robin of whoever is going to be coming to my house, but they do have that decision to make. In terms of outpatient therapy, um, we have multiple sites, multiple locations, um, all of which have dedicated pediatric therapists, dedicated pediatric equipment, um, and these are all um, listed. bring it all together in all of the cases that we looked at and all of the discussion about each individual infant, child, and family, there are key roles that a pediatric therapists will play. So we can look at the roles as really dichotomous. So there's the education role and then there's the advocacy role. Um, so really explaining to the families why so they can understand the what. You know, um, so my three year old who has chronic ear infections and visual challenges and tantering and the list goes on and on. When we can kind of dig back after developing a rapport with that family and kind of under teach them to understand why these things are happening, why these things are kind of the long term consequences in a very non judgmental way. Um, that's how we can really affect change and get that buy in from families about some of the strategies or ideas that we're suggesting. Um, so sometimes families are kind of at their wits end and you show up at their doorstep, right? So they want to know how to make things better. They want to know how their care routines can go smoother. They want to know how their child can be um, more successful and quite frankly, easier to care for. Um, and so we have a huge role in education. Um, part of that role in education is really to use family-friendly language. Um, everything we talked about today was at the really collegiate level, and so paring it down to essentially a third or fourth grade level is most important um, because these families are really only going to be responding to the information that they can understand, they can really grasp a hold of. Um, and so giving them that guidance of what to expect and how to expect it um, is so important. We want to also educate our key stakeholders regarding the value of therapy across the continuum. So um, prior to joining St. Luke's, I had um, the opportunity to do a ton of education in a variety of different settings. Um, I kind of viewed it as OT at the 30,000 uh, foot level. Um, and so part of that education is really explaining that long term kind of developmental continuum, um, educating the importance, why therapy, um, why across that continuum of development. Um, so we have that role of education kind of in the microcosm of the family and then sort of that bigger, bigger macro piece. And then when we look at advocacy, um, care coordination is a huge element um, of our role, referring to different programs, services, and providers, kind of pulling it all together. Um, I sometimes liken our role to kind of having all these ingredients, but we don't really know what the recipe is yet. Um, so we have all these ingredients and sometimes we have to refer to a different chef or a different baker um, to kind of give their lens on, on what else is going on and how best to um, affect change for these kiddos. We also have a huge role um, in terms of advocacy for policy change at the local, state, and national level. Um, again, in my former role, I had an opportunity to assemble a legislative breakfast for the local representatives. Um, and really, the whole talk was similar to this at a much different level. Um, so it was more the practical, you know, what are your constituents experiencing? What are the resources in your community? Um, and hands down, all of them were like, I had no idea that this diagnosis even existed, right? So they're going to Harrisburg, um, you know, they're, they're looking at, at laws, they're looking at changing legislation, um, and they're looking at the bigger opioid crisis, but I don't think they made that dotted line to the trickle down. Um, and so as clinicians, as therapists, we all have a role in terms of advocacy and, and policy change. 
and then ultimately requesting continued services as appropriate to third party payers. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I've um, had the opportunity to speak to a variety of different insurance companies um, explaining the why, right? So, so why do I need 12 more visits or why do I need 24 more visits? Here's why, here's what we know, here's what the science tells us about the long-term um, effects and here's um, what we know about therapy making some changes. Um, so just to summarize, um, we talked about the etiology and defining characteristics of neonatal abstinence syndrome. We explained three elements of the process of therapeutic weaning based on the differential diagnosis of NAS in the NICU setting. We described three benefits of non-pharmacological treatment strategies and um, ultimately defined the role of pediatric therapy um, in NAS. Um, so just a couple pages of references. Feel free to check them out. They're wonderful. And um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Go ahead. What pediatric therapy services do we provide within St. Louis and the NICU? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so I'm actually going to defer that question um, regarding um, NICU services to the uh, neonatology team and medical team. They are actually out today in Harrisburg um, at an all-day training on neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, so the timing, unfortunately, didn't overlap, but um, I would defer to them for questions directly related to the NICU. Thank you. Sure. Steve, do you have some concluding questions? So just to wrap up, uh, make sure you bring me your uh, completed paperwork, and if you're from New Jersey, you must sign out as well. Uh, thank you very much for everybody online. Make sure you email me through Twitter.